Okay, so in our last demonstration where we left off, we um, had essentially finished our wireframe up. There are a couple little things that you might want to go in and do. Um, and first, uh, the first thing I would consider doing is getting rid of all of this white space and going ahead and cropping it. If you want to leave it there, you can. Just don't forget to deal with it. So um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take my crop tool while this th whole thing is uh, in in a fit view, which by the way, if you're not sure how to get that, you can do it down here um, uh, and go ahead and fit it to screen. Uh, so I'm going to drag this up and it should snap to my bottom uh, footer layer and I'm just going to go ahead and enter that and so now my document is smaller. And before I save this file, what I'm going to do is uh, well, I could save this. Let's just go ahead and save this. Um, now, before I do anything else, I think one of the things that I would like to do is go ahead and save this as a different version. So I'm going to go File, Save As. And the reason I'm going to do this is that you've kind of gotten yourself in a good like place now where you have a good working image or you have a good working file. And let's say that something bad happened to that file. Well, if it gets corrupted or something happens to it later, you can always at least go back to this file. So I think that um, what I'll do is I'll call this uh, Werner Mitchell 1280 view. Um, and I think now what I'm going to do, since we're, we're getting to a place where we're about to start adding images, is I'm going to say um, with images. And so I'm saving this as a new file. And from this point forward, this is the one that we're going to be working on. And that way you'll have a backup of at least this stage. Okay. Now, <clears throat> after cropping that, one of the other things that I did notice also, let's go back to my web page, is that I one of the things that I kind of wanted to do is put a drop shadow just so you can kind of see some level of depth. And I'm not going to put that everywhere in the website. Uh, I think sometimes people, when they put drop shadows and things, they kind of go crazy with it. And you don't have to put a drop shadow on everything just because you put it on one thing. And so what I want to do is sort of put a drop shadow underneath this navigation bar and the badge so that it feels like that is something literally that's sitting on top of the page. Um, and that's easy enough to do. So if I come back up here, I'm going to blow this up. And so, you know, one of the things that I'm having trouble with, I just realized, is that uh, I would like to be able to see more of my layer panel right now. That The character panel is really not important to me. But it might be later. So I'm going to dock it here in the short bar. And I'm going to also take my adjustments, which are going to be important soon enough. And then the styles, um, if I wanted to, I could just close this group because... Um, I'm, I'm really not interested in that very much. It's not something I need to see right now. So anyway, I'm going to look at this. And what, I look, what I'm looking for is um, the navigation bar. And that would be in, uh, actually not that, it'd be in the header uh, layer group. And in the header layer group, I'm going to go to where it says BG nav, because that's the background of our nav. And that is where um, I'm going to add that drop shadow. Now, so that I can see better what I'm doing, I'm going to go ahead and make it so that the, the guides are not showing. And so we have this, all right. And I'm going to go and just simply go down to where it says FX, and I'm going to add a drop shadow. And, you know, I'm not a believer in making super heavy drop shadows. That's kind of you know, up to you what level of drop shadow you would want to do. So I think that the the standard opacity always starts at about 75. I think because this is like the last thing that I use somewhere, it remembers my setting. I think op opacity for me it is, is pr pretty good at about like 35 on this. And the distance for me, I'm actually pretty happy with that at about 3 and having a size of 5 with a zero spread. If you want to adjust that, you can kind of see what happens. The spread just puts it out further, but it's not necessarily going to blur it. So I'm usually not a big one on the spread. Uh, but one of the things I, I do want to do is I want to change this angle so that it's at 90 degrees. Um, I find that a lot of times, uh, especially if you're doing things that go full width, you want 90 degree um, 
uh, drop shadows because then you don't have weird skewing um, whenever you have edges like in the corners here. If you give it any kind of skewed angle then one, one side's going to have a greater level of drop shadow than the other which can be strange when you have top down stuff. So I'm going to go ahead and, and stick with that. And then the next thing that I'm going to also do is find my badge right here and I'm going to add a drop shadow to that too. And I'm going to keep the same settings and you can see that, well, I'm going to at least try to keep the same settings, and you can see a little bit of a drop shadow. You know, this might actually be useful to have this one uh, a little bit heavier or a little bit greater in, in distance. Um, so that one, instead of three, I might do four, and I also might increase the size a little bit, and what that does is it sort of increases the blur. And then for this, I might increase the spread. Uh, Actually, I don't think I do want to increase the spread. I think the size is a little bit too big. So let's try seven. And we can also increase the distance as well. Let's try five. And then that actually starts to feel more like the drop shadow that's up at the top, even though it's technically got a different, uh, um, a different value. So I'm going to go ahead and say OK with that. And so now I've got my drop shadow. And it adds just a little bit of depth and dimension to the layout. Okay, so I'm going to save this file now. And something else that I want to talk about just super quick is uh, about swatches. And, you know, I've already shown you how you can load swatches and stuff like that. And this is maybe a point in a project where, you know, maybe if you're working in a team, let's say you get hired to do something and you're working in a group, and you're not the person who's going to be add adding the image assets, you're just going to be setting up wireframes or something like that, um, then, uh, you know, this is a place where maybe you'd want to grab your swatches, save it out, and, and then make sure that those little kinds of assets, like swatches and fonts and things like that, are actually stored in a file for somebody. So one of the things you can do is go up to your swatches and you know do a save swatch. And then you can actually, instead of putting it in the normal Adobe Presets folder, you can actually go and save it in your project folder. Um, so let's just do that really fast. And I'll go into the Warner Mitchell. And I'm going to actually create a new folder that is called um, uh, PS doc. Well, I'll say document um, resources. You can call it whatever you want. And I'm going to call it uh, Werner Mitchell swatches, something. OK. And it's going to save those swatches out for you so that you can pass them on to someone else and then they can just load them into Photoshop. Okay, So at some point, maybe in this point, if you haven't already done that, uh, you can save out your swatches. And the reason that I kind of waited to save my swatches, you'll notice here, I did before only have like, I think, five swatches that I got from my color scheme creator. Um, but then I added a couple other and I named them. One was tangerine and one was green grass. And I didn't do that in front of you in the demo. I did that whenever I just kind of went through here and made the rest of my vectors so you didn't have to watch me. Well, the way that you can easily add stuff, all right, or add swatches, is that while you have a color selected down in your foreground, let's say that we wanted, I don't know, let's say we wanted some kind of purple color. All right, if that's in my foreground and I click, see how I've got a paint bucket in my swatch panel? If I click there, it's going to say, what do you want to name this? And I could call this, I don't know, well, let's call it, uh, let's just call it purple. I I'm not feeling very creative about names right now. And then it adds a new swatch. Now, if I don't really want that to be part of my normal set, all I would have to do is go down to replace swatches. And then don't save the current set because I don't want that purple. That was the whole point of us doing this. And then you can go you know, to, to the document resource folder that you just made and choose your ACO file. And boom, it gets rid of the purple for you and puts back the original swatches that you, that you had. OK, so um, and that's something we sort of covered a little bit before. This is a reiteration. But it's also like a workflow issue too as well. OK, so now we're at a place where we can really start thinking about adding images. and um, Let's just look real quickly at uh, some resources. All right, so one of the resources that uh, I could recommend to you, this website called Free Images. And, you know, they have some uh, royalty-free images. But like most stock photography websites, 
they're not all royalty free. So you kind of have to pick through and choose. And then there's also Pond 5. I stock going to have to sort of weed through and that's all I, I find that that's always a kind of a pain but anyway um but now we're getting to the two that I think are really great they're not exactly stock photo uh websites but they're um they're websites where people upload stuff that they don't mind sharing and this is a really cool one it's called unsplash.com I love this website they have really good high resolution photos and they're usually kind of already optimized and really cool um, you know uh, you can download them you can use them they're not it's not really searchable okay so you get 10 new photos every 10 days you can subscribe to this or you know whatever and you can as it says do whatever you want but you might want to read you know the fine print here um, and then it gives you some information um, but and it says you can even use them for uh, commercial purposes and you should always read any kind of licensing ish, uh, statement that any um, website has for its photography that it's letting you use and the reason you should read that is like if you ever do client work and you don't read those disclaimers you can get yourself in quite the conundrum um, if somebody comes back to you and says either cease and desist or give me money okay anyway so this this one just has endless awesome photos but unfortunately you know it's not really searchable so you just have to really spend the time looking and scrolling and anyway morgfile.com is another one of my favorites um, now not all of their stuff is royalty free they used to only have free photos that just members would upload and then then they kind of got like really popular um, and so you can there are different kinds of licenses um, but if you click on free photos it's really going to take you to truly free photos. You're not going to have to weed through and maybe they're free and maybe they're not. Okay. Um, and you can, what's really cool about this website is that you can search by any kind of topic or name and then see here we've got morgue file, but then they also let you search through iStock, Getty, Dreamtime, the stuff that's not free. Um, but I'm telling you, this is a great resource and it has been for years. And as I said, it's searchable and they're very high res photos. Each individual person who uploads stuff, like let's look at this, it'll have um, the licensing information and what you can do with it. Um, and then you can download the high res image here um, and so forth. And then you know you can look at the keywords, comments, you can post a comment if you want. And if it was taken where it gave ge uh, geographical data, you know, like using a smartphone or something like that, then uh, if the person had that enabled, on their device, then it'll show you so you can see information from the metadata about the picture of as to where it was taken. Anyway, these two are my favorite resources though. Okay, so having said that, um, I'm also going to provide you, uh, you'll see in your, um, you'll see in the, the, the project uh, or the assignment file, um, description or outline you'll see that I provided some image resources if you want to follow exactly with uh, the exercise before you like put your own stuff in so that you can at least get the same kind of outcomes that's totally understandable um, and what I've done is I've added a folder in my Werner Mitchell web folder and it's called resource image files and there's a Google Mac screenshot that I've provided um, and then there's, because um, we're going to use that in the contact section. And then there's some high resolution images. So this would be like maybe the picture that I would want to use in the commercial gallery placeholder. And then this one maybe for residential in that placeholder. This is one that I'd like to use as that background image in that blue banner section. This typewriter is one that I think I'm going to want to use like behind the con. Um, the behind the the main contact us section and uh, this is one that I think I'd like to use behind our team and so then and then we also have team members so I'm going to provide you with that so you don't have to look that up and you're free to feel free to use this so these are just some random pictures of people and you know but that I, I was able to get them off of the free um, I think off of morgue file or something so anyway uh, so that those are some of the ways that you can look for images find images and at least for doing um, this exercise 
uh, you'll have access to these.